gentlemen, welcome once again to another episode of It's Me Speaking to You. I am, as always, your host, ever faithfully, Jeffrey Wilson, coming to you live and always direct from the gateway to the West, St. Louis, Missouri. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not letting you down again. We have a very, very interesting guest this week. His name is Steve Steven. I'm not sure if he goes for the Steve or the Steven. Steve Walden. Stephen Walden. You can find his art, and I normally do this at the end, but I'm going to do this at the beginning so you can kind of peruse this gentleman's art while we speak because it's amazing. It's StephenWaldenArt.com. I think that's correct. Tre- correct me if I'm wrong, sir. I met this gentleman about a year ago. I was at a a WrestleMania party at another friend's house. I walk in the basement. Everyone's zoned in on the screen, and I look back in the corner, and there's a gentleman painting. So I thought, you know, that seems interesting at the WrestleMania party, and I couldn't see what he was painting because I was coming from the other, you know, the other angle on the other side of his easel there, and I wrap around and see what this guy's working on, and I was just blown away. I was just blown away. I, I just, as an artist myself, I love seeing artists who are really good at expressing their art and he is amazing at it ladies and gentlemen if you go to stephenwaldenart.com you will see exactly what i'm talking about he pretty much specializes in it's it's i'll let him describe the style but the subject is mostly kind of pop culture pop art comics sports I mean, some of the stuff he has is absolutely amazing. The pictures he has of St. Louis le- uh, Cardinal legend Ozzie Smith, uh, St. Louis pitcher legend Adam Wainwright, Kurt Warner, John Hamm from Mad Men. These renderings are amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that was long-winded. Please welcome to the program Mr. Stephen Walden. How are you, sir? I'm awesome, Jeffrey. Thank you for that intro. I feel like uh, we can only go down from here. So thank you. <laughs> Well, I tell you, man, like I said, I always try to have people on with very interesting stories. And like I said, I, I met you not too long ago. We haven't had many interactions. Um, most recently, the Halloween party where you had the awesome Halloween costume as uh, as Bill Cosby with the Bill Cosby sweater. That was quite classic. Um, what else have you been up to, man? I see you. you, you the, the art is exploding. Um, from the time I met you, you you literally running into everybody, man. You got your picture taken with your art and Ozzy Smith, you and Adam Wainwright in the piece. What you been up to, brother? Yeah, I've been staying busy with painting, which is pretty ridiculous, uh, considering that you know so many other artists have to have a side job to keep the painting and whatever art media that they're in keep that part afloat. And for me, this has been kind of an accidental career, and. Right. Yeah, because so in August, I had just finished my master's degree in professional counseling at Webster. And the intent was that by now I should be having (laughs) kind of an entry-level job as a counselor, as a case manager or something. But one of the things that happened, so I'll back up, is that in 2012 is when I enrolled in Webster's counseling program, their master's in counseling program. And I was in that now along the way. I took uh, an art therapy class as an elective, and my classmates saw my work, and they said, wow, you're pretty good. You should consider putting your stuff out there. And and I thought, you know, that's just kind of what your friends tell you is that it's good. But then I kept painting and kept at it and then had my first actual exhibition that I was a part of through mysmart.org, which is for up-and-coming artists. It's held out in Webster Groves and had three pieces that were accepted in that show. And since then, like you said, things have just really taken off. And, you know, it's just been about the hustle of just uh, continuing to paint and then continuing to connect with people that I think would respond to my painting and and how my art can do some good because I also partner up with a lot of nonprofit agencies. That's what fulfills the, the helping others bucket that I thought that I would be, that would be overflowing by now. Uh, right. on the side of my master's degree and that was you know a concern it's like well if I donate or if I uh, devote my career from this point on to art then how am I going to be able to help others which that was a big reason that I enrolled in the program in 2012 mm-hmm. because that that in and of itself was also a career change for you know different reasons we can get into later but yeah the whole art thing is just it's it's been an accident, but as Bob Ross would say, it's a happy little accident. That, that's insane that you just said that because that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> it's, inter- it's interesting to quote that. Like, you know, it's 
you know, you had a certain plan, but, you know, life, the universe, whatever you want to call it, had another plan, but you're still applying your desire or, you know, you wanting to help people, but just in a different way. Um, what, what, what exactly draws you to this particular style? It's so, so very unique, so eye popping, so colorful, the colors you use, it's amazing. What, what exactly drew you to this particular type of style? And what is it called? Is there, is there, is it called something that I'm just ignorant? Uh, <laughs> we can come up with a name if we want to. <laughs> Good we art. Call it Good it's art. It's Waldenism. You know, it's the Waldenism. There we movement. go. I like that. I like that. 2015, the uh, greater Midwest area. No, I, I, my influences are, are wide. And uh, I've mentioned to other people before that, and I'll get a little art history on you and that, uh, 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 Henri Matisse was a big influence, and he painted in bold colors, and he was a member of the Fauvist movement, and they were very much uh, about, you know, painting the wild colors. It's where the name comes from. Um, it was originally supposed to be an insult, the Fauves. Uh, I think the translation is wild beast, and it was this idea of using colors in a way that, that weren't really controlled, and it was seen as, at the time, it was seen immature and childish, and as it gain steam later on, you know, it became something that was just highly venerated. And so that's part of it. That's the, the intellectual answer and the real hoity-toity <laughs> answer. But it also goes back to, I love comics and Jack Kirby and, and four-color inspirations from Neil Adams and stuff in the 70s. And, you know, back when Batman wore blue and gray with the yellow symbol and was with, you know, uh, Robin in red and yellow and green. And, and you have, you uh, have for everyone who happens to be on StephenWaldenArt.com, there is a rendering of the Batman, the old 60s Batman in the gray costume in which you speak. Yeah, I did uh, an Adam West. That was part of an exhibition for Rankin-Jordan Pediatric uh, Children's uh, Hospital, um, the Pediatric Bridge Hospital. Pediatric and Children, the same name would be a little redundant. Um, but for, uh, for Rankin-Jordan, they did uh, an event, and I wanted to do something that was kid-friendly and kids would uh, like and respond to, but also something that the older set would be, because, hey, it's Batman, but Absolutely. the older set like, hey, it's Adam West. So Well, and you got the old-school Christopher Reeves Superman, which you recently finished, which I've commented to you uh, around the time you were working on it. I was just like, I I grew up watching Christopher Reeves, so, I mean, that, that's Superman to me. That That's just awesome, man. What you did with that is just absolutely amazing. And you do have, so everyone who knows, you have different versions of these copies. You can get 3D copies. You can get, I mean, speak to that if people are wondering if they want to pick up some of your stuff, um, how you can render them in different ways. Well, the the 3Ds are going to be 3D no matter what version you purchase. And the way that I, I like to offer them is there's the original that's available, and then I offer two prints. Uh, one is a poster print, and this is for most pieces. Some pieces I don't. Just it depends on what it is. Right. Um, and it's a poster print, which is mass-produced on high-quality glossy stock paper, you know, and I sign everything. And then there's the thing that exists between the original and the poster print, and that's a hand-embellished canvas print. And that's a piece that it has been reproduced on canvas, and then uh, I paint on top of that. And so it is something, uh, like I said, it's an intermediary between a uh, poster print and an original, and that at that point it's an original piece of work or it's a unique piece of work with the paint that's been applied to uh, to the surface. And those are usually signed and numbered, and there's a limited edition of those that I produce. And there's something for, for mostly every price range, I think. Yeah, and again, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to Stephen, StephenWaldenArt.com, you can see all of these. He breaks it down. You know, there, As he said, there's different price ranges. He's, you know, Not all of these break the bank, but there are definitely some more higher-end pieces. Um, as you said, it seems that things have like, <clears throat> truly excuse me, it's exploded in this last year. These pictures I've seen on your website, which is just, which is just amazing from the time I met you till, till basically this moment. I mean, are those pictures with you and Ozzy Smith and Wainwright and Kurt Warner, are those all within this last year or so? They're not just within the last year. They're within the last, I would say, three months. Uh, and, wow. and how It's been pretty atomic. And, and I've got some other things that are in the future that are going to be just as big. Uh, and I can't officially announce them now because we're trying to get down some paperwork. But um, that's, you know, a continued push is to work with celebrities because, for one, that's the subject matter of my art. And the other thing is that the, the people who I'm working with, they're also, they have some level of, 
social consciousness that they're wanting to be in the community and wanting to help people. And so it's just trying to find those people like Ozzy, like Wayno, um, like uh, oh, who are some of the Kurt Warner, you know, some of the other guys that are local that I've worked with that are very much intent on helping other people. I'm just today I just finished up with phase one of the Mike Matheny piece, the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, I That's, saw some of that. I was gonna yeah, on his fa on his Facebook page and we'll give all the social networking stuff. Yeah, you can see some of his uh beginning works, how he's you know, starting out with Mr. Matheny. So go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's one, that's one that I finished up for the Rankin Jordan Gala event that's going to be in mid-January, and Mike will be there, and he'll autograph it, and he'll probably speak at the event as well like he did last year because Mike does a lot of work with Rankin Jordan. I had some, uh, some, some uh, deep ties with them, uh, and, you know, he and I spoke at uh, Kurt's event because he was also there, and, and it was one of the things that we really connected over is the the great work that Rankin Jordan does and and their approach to health and and healing and and you know how we are both just really honored just to be a part of that but he's going to have this other piece uh, he's going to autograph it and I just finished the painting part of it today and it's actually going to be a piece that I'm going to apply 24 karat gold leaf to Whoa. and so it's going to even be even more resplendent and iridescent bling, bling, bling. Although, yeah going to bling it out. Um, but there, there's reason for, for choosing that with gold and that um, I, the, there's a story behind uh, Mike and, and Rankin Jordan in that he connected with them. Uh, there was a, a young man, uh, Sean Glanville, who was, and I, I, I may screw up the details of the story, so I'll try and tell it in broad strokes, but he was treated at Rankin Jordan and Mike was very close with the Glanville family. And Sean passed away. Uh, not too long ago, and so before the end or before the start of last season, Mike changed his number from 22 to number 26 in honor of Sean because that was a number that Sean wore at um, when he played hockey as, uh, in high school and and these other levels. And so Mike's number is 26 now, and it's an homage to Sean, and there's a nod to Rankin Jordan. That's again why this piece that I did why his jersey number is actually the most prominent thing in that piece because that's the thing that tells the story and the connection between Rankin Jordan and Sean Glanville. And then I wanted to include gold leaf because uh, of the historical connotations of gold leaf and how gold appears throughout art history as uh, usually those who have, uh, when there's a divine revelation or divine truth that has been revealed and there's such a a spiritual component to Mike and, and his own mission, and hmm. there's so much spiritual healing that that occurs within the walls of Rankin Jordan. That I wanted, I wanted that to be echoed in the piece itself, and so it's halfway there. And so it's like, yes, it's bling, but it's bling with the purpose. Yeah, you know? no, I wasn't saying that as any kind of negative connotation. No, 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 no. And that's really cool, man. I think that's you know, well, whatever. That's a whole other conversation, a little bit. But that's cool that you are you are um, educated in art and kind of knowing the kind of subtle almost symbol symbolism if you will to kind of throw that and add that in there and like i said and have it not be frivolous have a a significance behind it i think that's awesome yeah and i think that goes back to when i was an undergraduate i went to the university of central arkansas and i was an english major but i have always been interested in art i drew in high school <clears throat> pardon me and i quit shortly after high school because of for, for a number of reasons but uh, I still enjoyed art, and I discovered art history. There was a fabulous uh, teacher at Central Arkansas, Gail Seymour. She won uh, at least one National Teacher of the Year thing, and um, she was just this amazing teacher. And it was just so interesting how, in art history, which the degree itself, you know, for people who major in art history, you know, I'll see you at Starbucks because that's pretty much <laughs> what you do with an art history degree. <laughs> Um, Talk about but, Sandro Botticelli and Matisse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, with the medium grande mocha frappuccino <laughs> bullshit, half cap, whatever. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that I loved art history because it, it combined all disciplines. And that there's a, a saying: if you understand a culture's art, you understand a culture. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. In that it's a snapshot of mm -hmm. what is important or popular to a people at that time. And I didn't create art uh, from 18 years old until, you know, 2000 and, what, 14. So there was like a 25-year stretch that I didn't do anything with art. 
Um, but I've always been a an avid reader and student of art, and I've always wanted to learn about it. And you know, art history is fascinating to me, and so that's you know, it's really cool that I'm able to kind of fold that in to what I'm doing now with the work. Right. Well, and that's cool, man. That's it's very wow, very multifaceted, and that's that's very interesting. And that's even more interesting that you didn't. I was going to ask you. I guess I kind of. Uh, I kind of jumped to where you are right now. So you didn't do any, I mean, other than just, other than maybe kind of do, you know, normal doodling, I guess, that we all do in high school, just drawing. You know. But so you didn't really um, do any kind of formal training at all as you were, when you were younger, maybe high school or, or anything? I took art classes in high school, but our art classes weren't real art classes. It was right, more, yeah. it was a glorified study hall. Exactly. Now, yeah, now, exactly. There, there were things that I was able to do. I remember, you know, uh, messing around with pastels. And if you look at some of my early work, it's, you know, it's embarrassing, not so much in the quality of it, but the subject matter, because one of the first ones that I, I in my early works, it's this pastel drawing of Luke Perry um, as Dylan from 90210. Oh, wow. But sorry. I know, but I was in high school in the early 90s, so that's what you're going to paint. No, that's, I'm not um, mad at you, brother. I was there, too. <laughs> I even had the sideburns, so, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, he was, like, he was like, like 35 when he was playing Dylan, by the way, or whatever it was. <laughs> he was like, it's an old, like, you know, grown-ass know, right? man playing a high school student. Anyway, go ahead. 90, yeah, 90210 AARP edition. Um, <laughs> but uh, I uh, I also did, you know, there are a couple other pieces I can remember, you know, playing around with pencils and inks and things like that. But I never painted. I, did, I never painted. Painting didn't happen until the art therapy class. And I quit art after high school, mostly because it bored me, um, because so much of what I thought art was was trying to capture something as how it looks in the real world and trying to copy it. And to a lot of people, that's what good art is. That's what they think good art is. And that's fine. And I, I'm cool with that. But when I see art that it is representative of how the real world looks. Typically the only thing that I take away from it is, wow, the person that did this is a really good artist and that's it. It right, doesn't right. Yeah. It doesn't make me feel anything. But it's like, you know, the pieces that, that I create and you know, why I choose the colors is uh, there's typically a subject matter that there's some intrinsic joy to it or that I want you to feel like a little kid when you look at it. Like yeah. the Han and Julie piece that I did. I did. Funny. I'm looking at that right now. I just did a Star Wars exhibit at Art Bar on Cherokee on Friday because we're a few days out from The Force Awakens coming out, and we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, in having that piece there and having a number of people come up to it, it was so great seeing these little kids, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, from these grown-ass adults that right. are seeing this piece, but they have a little kid reaction to you know, this three foot by four foot rendering of Han Solo and Chewbacca yeah. that's done in these, you know, wild colors. And that's the reaction that I want. That's, that's the feeling that I want to inspire when somebody looks at my piece. Well, yeah, and you, and not only, and not only is the subject matter pretty evocative, I mean, especially if you're kind of, I don't know, nerds like me or you as, as it relates to comic books, old school Star Wars, mm -hmm. et cetera, not only did, is it subject matter evocative, but the colors are evocative as well it just they just bounce right off the canvas and it totally does remind you of of i don't know just just comic books or saturday morning cartoons like everything is just very very popping and uh yeah and your color choices are also just man so so interesting man some of them are even a little little psychedelic if you will but it's just yeah. like, it's, it's it's really cool man i hope everybody i've been saying stephen walden com. i apologize it's stephen com. go check him out these these pieces are absolutely amazing there's a funny story about that. Actually, believe it or not, StephenWaldenArt.com does work. It bounces to Stephen Walden. Oh, and what's okay. so funny is that um, I, I was talking about it with a friend of mine a few months ago, and this is when StephenWalden.com was up and running. He said, you really need to take a look and get Stephen Walden Art as well if you can. And I jumped out on GoDaddy, and I was like, all right, StephenWaldenArt.com, let's, let's go ahead and grab that because I got Stephen Walden, and there, I know there are plenty of Stephen Waldens out there, but hopefully I'm the only artist. And when it came up on GoDaddy, it said, sorry, this domain name has already been taken. Uh, and I said, motherfucker, you know, yeah. who is this son of a bitch? I know. I went to whois.net and I looked it up. I owned it already. I'd just forgotten that I'd purchased it many, many months ago. I, I don't know. I just got drunk and, you know, I'm like, I'm pulling on GoDaddy and I'm registering everything. 
Um, <laughs> it, was, it was funny. Yeah, and so I just went on there, and now so it works. It it, it bounces you to stephenwalden.com, so that's cool. Well, there you go. Uh, Either stephenwalden.com or stephenwaldenart.com is where yeah. you can find it. I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? Uh, oh, we were talking about colors and and color choices in that. So if you think back when you had coloring books when you were a kid, it's that if you had a Spider-Man coloring book or whatever, and if you wanted to make Spider-Man green, then you did it. It wasn't about trying to get it right. It was about, you know, I don't have to get this on model because I'm not, you know, a graphic designer that's trying to respond to a, a branding style guide. No, you're doing it because that's what feels right. That's right. what feels right. cool. That's what feels cool. Yeah, and not not to interrupt you, but going back to what you were saying about, I think it's all art. Even if somebody does draw like a perfect rendering of something, like and it looks exactly like mm -hmm. it, I think that is still art. But there isn't much individuation to it. You know what I mean? Well, right. you're talking about exactly, and that came when you were a kid, dude. I'm gonna paint Spider-Man green. I don't give a fuck. In my world, Spider-Man is green, and and you know right. it, it really kind of, and that's really an, an artistic mind too, breaking down barriers you know, of you know of of normality, conformity as far as you know, rules, I mean, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, and et cetera, and there's all these rules that it's just like, you know what, these things are made to be broken, you know, it's it's all about, it's all about what we're creating, and, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, it's a valid point, and, you know, and I will say that for those people that do do the photorealistic art, and they do, you know, try to render things as they look in real life, I'm not, I don't want to denigrate that as art. Neither do I, neither do I, neither, I don't want to say that. Not, right, that's not what I do anymore, it's what I used to do. But again, that was because that's what I thought art was, and it wasn't until I had a recent conversation with a friend of mine, Matt Colley, who is an artist out of New York, uh, mattcauley.com, A-T-T-C-A-U-L-E-Y.com. Uh, he does some really fantastic uh, portraits, and nobody paints flesh and people better than Matt Colley. Uh, check him out. Cool. But, uh, <clears throat> but he and I were having a conversation about this, about expressiveness in art, and he said, you know, if you look at little kid drawings, they're, they're, the figures that they draw, the proportions are wonky, the expressions in the faces, they have huge smiles sometimes that are even bigger than the heads themselves. But then when you look at high school kids and their drawings, the, the way that they produce art is so much tighter yeah. and constricted. They're trying to get it right. They're trying not to fail. There's a lot of erasing. And, and, and if you notice now, I don't mean to interrupt, I apologize, but what comes to mind is the animation we see today, starting back to like breaking the rules, like Ren and Stimpy. Now we have these yeah. like just crazy things now, uh, uh, Adventureland. <laughs> like it, these are things that look like even South Park. It looks like something uh -huh. that kids drew because uh -huh. they broke the rules. And I, you're absolutely right. It is way tighter as you get older. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're right. I think if you, like a good analog is if you look at, Oh, I don't know, maybe South Park or Squidbillies or, you know, something that has non-standard animation compared right. to Super Friends or Transformers exactly. yeah. or which those things were. Aqua Teen Hunger I, Force. Right, but they're trying to get things right in how they looked and they're also trying to sell a product at the time. It's like this is the toy that as it's going to look on the shelves. So, right. um, which is a whole other side of art and the commercial side of it because there are some yeah. artists that I've talked with and, they don't, they don't believe in selling their art. They can't part with it. There's some that don't believe in selling prints. And so, you know, they're, they're, it's just so interesting how there are so many different subcultures and yeah. different schools of thought within um, the art world. And I'm just, I'm just stepping my toe out in it. Like, don't let me come off like any kind of an expert. I can only tell you what my experience has been, but it's a very short experience in and of that. Well, and it's it's. I mean, not that it's. You've been successful. I mean, people people have gravitated to it. People have responded to it. You know, these are your legitimate, uh, you know, expressions that you're trying to put out there to share with people, not just for monetary gain, but like you said, you have some kind of uh, uh, public serving the public gain as well. Um, you know, I, I think you know whether it's whether it's three months or three years, and, and honestly, whether it's this or anything else, the longer you've been in the game. And I don't know, sometimes I think that tends to make you rigid, you know, uh, yeah. as far as your perspective on things. I mean, I think, I don't know, I, that, that might sound a little too crazy, but. Um, no, I, I think that you're right. I think that uh, sometimes the longer that you're in, you stop challenging, you stop changing. Yeah, yeah. It's more formulaic. And because formula becomes comfortable and formula sells tickets, I mean, shit, look at Adam Sandler, you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah. 
the reason yeah. I want to talk about, you know, something that's a little bit existing in a closed loop, a closed system, and, you know, in South Park is poked fun of it with, you know, the different Rob Schneider. Rob Schneider is a stapler. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, and it's, but again, it's that, it's that balance of creativity versus the almighty dollar because at the end of the day, we all have bills to pay. Right. So it's that I, I want to do stuff that that does uh, straddle worlds and that it's going to be artistically relevant but also commercially viable and that people are going to want it. So, And that's, that, that's, that's why there's a certain intention in the things that I choose to do and how I choose to render them. And that's, that's very interesting. Like you said, everyone kind of has their own sensibility on it. Um, I had a, had on a very good friend who's a photojournalist who used to shoot for the uh, Sacramento Bee um, and uh-huh. still and is a very, very uh, successful photographer. He said the same thing. You know, he's he has nothing beats shooting stuff that he just loves to shoot. Uh, right. But there are those commercial shoots that are time consuming, laborious, you know, pain in the ass, but they're they're paying them bills you know, that are able to support all that technical stuff. So, I mean, like everyone does have their different, you know, stick on how they want to proceed with it. But, you know, for most pragmatic people, you know, you want to be able to express your passion. But at the same time, it's always nice to eat. You know, it's always nice, right. to, have, always nice to have the lights on. Yeah. You know, you, I, I don't know. I mean, it's on the film and acting world. It's that you want to do the blockbuster and that way that you stay relevant. But then you also do the little independent movies that are, the real passion projects. And right. I, that's, that's true with, with everyone in all levels and that there could be someone who their job is a project manager at a, you know, a local uh, uh, industry in town, but, you know, on the weekend, maybe they like to make craft beer, you know, and that's, that's their dream that they want to do. And, you know, luckily for me, it's that I've been able to walk away from, you know, different jobs that weren't fulfilling for me and to find a career that is fulfilling and it is keeping my lights turned on and, and I'm able to actually uh, to eat out, you know, whenever I, not whenever I want to. <laughs> to I don't, I'm, not, I'm not limited to figuring out, okay, I've got $5 this week, what will that Right, buy? right. Well, I, was, in a minute, I just want to tell you a real funny story, that a revelation that happened to me this weekend as I went out uh, to, uh, to a friend's birthday party this weekend and I thought, you know, a year ago there's no way that I could have afforded it because it, went to, it was a nicer uh, Asian restaurant and what was interesting is that, you know, I was thinking, man, a year ago I was just, I was really trying to scrounge and scrape and get by and what you do in that is that you go to, you know, your price chopper or whatever and you get the big pallet of ramen, you know, <laughs> back in the for, you know, three dollars and thirty six cents. Yes, sir. And what was funny is that uh when I realized after they had brought up my order I had actually ordered ramen. It was just it was shrimp ramen, you know, and it was like there's a difference between eighteen dollar ramen and you know, right. <laughs> because I'm like, wow, this would buy five thousand packages of my shrimp flavored uh, ramen. <laughs> five thousand I'd be eating for months. Yeah. <laughs> I'm living it now, man. Rolling in it. Well, and no, and bro, that's that's absolutely cool, man. I mean, obviously, you're the. It's. I always tell people if your intention is pure, if you have a passion and your intention is pure, not just to make the dough, but if your intention is pure and you really, you know, really want to be good at what you do. This, the, the dough and all that stuff is just going to come. It's just going to be – it's a byproduct of greatness. It's not why you're doing it, but it's, it's just a byproduct of, of being good at what you do. And there's definitely nothing wrong with it, and it's cool when it happens, man. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you for that. I appreciate that. That's the hope that, that that happens. Sometimes it doesn't line up that way, but I recently read this book by Mark Cuban. Um, well, I, I love Mark Cuban. Um, you know, he's the guy from Shark Tank and all the Dallas Mavericks, and you know, he keeps it real. And one of the, the points that he made in this book is that if you are in a job and the primary reason that you're in it is for the money, then you're probably not in the right job. Right. And that if you want something that really aligns with your passion, then do something that you are willing to live like a student while you figure out how to make it successful. Amen, brother. And that that really spoke to me. And and I think I mentioned this on in another interview is that um, you know, it's that it, it gave me permission to be like, you know what, no, this is not the house that I want to be living in in 10 years. It's not the car that I want to be driving in 10 years. And, 
you know, there are things that I definitely want to change, but I know that living the life that I have now, uh, I'm not beholden to a huge house payment, a huge car payment, these other things that would make me more of a slave to uh, a job and to that paycheck where, you know, now it's like I have so much more flexibility. Mm. And it's just that level of freedom that is that is really difficult to purchase. I mean, today I woke up at, you know, God, it's like 1 p.m. And right. now I was up until 3 a.m. last night painting and working. Yeah. But yeah. There, there's no other, you know, what, there are a few other positions um, that where, you know, I can do that. I can come and go as I please. And it requires a certain a different level of work ethic, and I have to make sure that I'm I'm actually painting and I'm producing stuff. Yeah, and I'm you not still have working. to work. You still, I mean, it's just, well, your, it's just your work. I mean, you don't consider it work. You just, I mean, whatever word you want to call it, you know, it's just, you're just right. playing, if you will, but you just have to get paid for it. it. It's work. I mean, there are the work sides of it, and that, you know, I have to make sure that I'm going back and forth to the mall where I have, you know, some gallery space. I have gallery space at Chesterfield Mall and the Mineworks Gallery, which is at, in the Macy's Wing, if any of your listeners want to go and check out some of my 3D artwork in person for themselves. But I don't think that you've seen my 3D stuff because no. 3D is actually, it's been a newer thing. So who knows, maybe at this WrestleMania, if uh, we have a party again, I'll do some 3D, I'll do like a 3D rock or nice. something. I don't know. Um, but uh, but if you want to see that uh, for yourself in person, then yeah, the Mindworks Gallery, Chesterfield Mall, uh, the glasses are there, they're included. Um, but going back to the idea of it being work, it's that, I have to figure out, okay, I have to take this stuff out there. I have to make sure that my inventory is, I have this, you know, many prints available or I have these things that are available. I have to keep track of, you know, my business cards and designing those. And But you're right in the sense that it, it's such a different, it doesn't feel like oppressive work that's crushing my soul. Right. You know, I no, absolutely. No, it, 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 sir, it, 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 it is literally the defining factor in one's quality of life. You know what yeah. I mean? You look at 270 every morning and tell yeah. me what percentage of those people are happy or or the whatever in California or those people who are inching in those freaking boxes to go to jobs that they freaking hate. You know what I mean? And they probably have some passion too, but aren't willing to do what you were just talked about a minute ago, live like a student while they cultivate it because they have a car note because they try to keep up with the Joneses. They have a mortgage for a house they don't, you know what I mean? All these different things. And that's a really a whole other conversation. But at the end of the day, what you're talking about is really a difference maker. For everybody out there who might be listening, man, I'm telling you, same thing. Follow your dreams, dude, because if you really want to put in the work for it and you are good at it, it'll pay off eventually. It really will. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it that's, changes that's, the quality oh. of your life, and I, that's cool, yeah. man. That's so cool because I do remember about a year ago when I met you, it, it wasn't all roses and sunshine, and not too long uh, after that, I'm seeing you with pictures with Adam Wainwright. I'm like, damn, this brother's flipped the script quickly. <laughs> yeah, things just really turned on a dime. I think I put out some kind of uh, um, um, morose and you know self-loathing post on Facebook of you know how I was just really frustrated with how things were going, and this was probably in the late summer, and it was so funny And how, well, number one, so many of my friends respond to that positively. They're like, keep at it. Don't don't give up. You're doing great. We love you, blah, blah, blah. And it made me realize why there are so many whiny motherfuckers on Facebook because it works. You know, you get attention that way. Professional victims, uh, dude. There are plenty of them out there. I know, right? Um, but, uh, but that was really great to get that, that kind of, you know, that nudge and that, you know, pat on the back, like, no, keep doing it, keep going. You were expressing then, real frustration as opposed yeah. to some habit of, like I said, like you just said, being a victim, like, oh, this right. is bad. No, this is bad. No, this is bad. Like, how, that's probably the one and only thing you did like that. You know, you were just expressing <laughs> genuine frustration. Right. Right. And, and when that happened and I got the feedback, you know, that was great. And then it was shortly after that, that's when things really started to change. That's when kind of the dam burst. Because even at that point, I was thinking, man, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay in St. Louis because of the way that the mental health job field is. And right. Not that I was going to get the one, the, the type of work that I wanted, which is, again, the which is so funny now and how I don't even have time to apply for those jobs. I'm turning down even copywriting jobs, which was my career before, you know, going into therapy as ways to help pay the bills because I can't I can't do those writing jobs because I've I've just got so many things that are in queue. And that's that's been that's been really, really cool and how 
yeah, things just really flipped. I don't want to say overnight, but it was over a week. Well, say three that. months, man. Like I said, if I, I'm going to be posting some of these images uh, on the YouTube version of this of this interview, and you're going to see, you know, these pictures. Literally, he said it was. I thought I figured within about a year these pictures took place. But Ozzy Smith, Kurt Warner, John Hamm, who else? Adam Wainwright. <clears throat> And that was kind of my next question. How did when did that happen? When was that initial blip on their when did your stuff jump on their radar initially? When did you get that, that first happened. call or that or did you mention that already? So that happened um about I was it was not long after that that uh, self loathing post that I made on Facebook. <laughs> I got kind of that thing did work, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I shouted out in the cosmos, please soothe me in the cosmos said, All right, here you go. This Facebook um, cosmos. But I uh I got partnered up with Rankin Jordan through uh, a mutual connection in the mental health field. And the CEO of Rankin Jordan, Lori Tanner, is a huge Cardinals fan. And she loved my work. And when we met, when you go into Lori's office, it's actually it's covered in cards, memorabilia, and art. And she's I absolutely love your work. And we connected immediately. And she said, I want to commission you to do a piece. And I said, okay, well, what do you want? And she said, I want to do Wayno. He's my guy. I said, okay, and then after that, it was we partnered together to figure out what scene would you want, and we immediately thought of it's the, the crouching, screaming pose of him right after he struck out uh, Carlos Beltran. And I, I think we even mimicked the pose together uh, when, uh, when we did that, and so I painted that for her, and then fast forward a couple of weeks, and she says, hey, is the Wayno painting done? Is there any way that you could bring it up to my office? Because I just heard from his agent, and this is uh, Wayno was uh, rehabbing because you know he was injured early on in the season. He spent a lot of the the regular season rehabbing until he had more downtime than uh, a lot of the other cards did. And she said he's actually going to be touring Rankin Jordan uh, in a couple of days. And I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, yeah, I would love for him to be able to see it because at this point it was just a surreal notion that the people that I paint would actually right, see, see it. stuff yeah. and do it. Yeah, which is which brings on a whole different level of anxiety. Uh, yeah. uh, are they going to like it? Are they going to think, yeah, no, that's yeah. not at all. You know, you screwed up my my my, uh, my nose or whatever. Right. What's well, anyway. these colors? What are these colors about? What's this color? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, what if, they, what if they really don't get it and they, they just they don't care? Right. Um, but uh, they said, okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely I'll bring up the piece. And so I knew that Adam has Big League Impact, which is a fantasy football charity that he runs where people pay to get into this fantasy football league with him and a bunch of other cards players, and John Hamm, Kurt Warner, Marshall Falk, uh, just some uh, local and national celebrities. And they play and compete, and it helps uh, bring drinkable, usable water to third world countries and uh, builds, uh, it helped build an orphanage in Haiti and a bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah, just really, really great work. And I knew that he had big league impact, and I said, Lori, when Adam comes by, would you please give me my business card if he likes my work and just say I would love to partner up with him and help him raise funds for his charity. And she said, I will do it. And then um, it was the following day when Adam had uh, had been there, uh, he tweets out a picture of him posing next to the painting, mimicking that crouching, yelling pose. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, at Stephen Walden, love your work, would love for you to be able to do some stuff with Big League Impact. Crucial tweet, my friend, crucial. Yeah, that, that, was, that was it. That was the thing that, where everything exploded from that point forward. And then we jump ahead to that night. Adam is messaging me uh, personally, which I'm kind of freaking out as I'm on my couch. <laughs> I, would, Adam, I, would, I would think so. I would think so. <laughs> and so and he and I are talking and you know, about what we're going to, to work together to do. And it was just such a, a perfect moment. Adam and I, we, we've connected and, you know, and, and bonded in a really, really cool way. He's just such a... a cool dude you know if, if he weren't uh the st louis cardinals pitcher if he you know worked at my old job and he were just the next cube over i would have such a man crush on him regardless of whether or not he can throw you know a split finger fastball right. it's like he's, he's such a goofball he's such a good guy right. he's so funny he's so smart you know i mean he's the guy that you you want to hang out with he right. just has such great energy that's why there's so many people 
in the St. Louis area and beyond who, who love Adam Wainwright. He's just a good dude. And that, and he's authentic, you know, and that, that just comes across. There was no, you know, going through a handler to talk to him to figure out how we're going to make this work for a charity. No, it was just nice. he messaged me out of the blue. And since then, yeah, we we message each other every now and then. And, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just a really cool relationship that has developed out of that. That's cool, man. That's very, very cool. That's, yeah. yeah. Man, that's so awesome. I mean, just to, just to honestly, literally, because by the time I met you, to literally like this moment, it seemed like yeah, like you said, things just went. Things have gone absolutely atomic for you, my friend, and I could not absolutely be happy for you. And bringing on kind of my next questions, what does the future hold? What do you have planned? I know you said some of some things you can't really speak on right now. Uh-huh. What um what can you speak on? Because obviously, you know, so much has opened up for you right now. What exactly is going to be going on for you in the next coming days and weeks and months ahead? Well, so we already talked about the Rankin Jordan Gala again. That's a big one. Yeah. I've I partnered up with Hollywood Casino, uh, and I have created a Budweiser Clydesdales piece that they will be, I believe it's going to be a part of the New Year's Eve festivities as a raffle that they're going to um, have there. It's also in 3D. Um, and I think they may even be giving the proceeds to Rankin Jordan, which would be really, really cool. So that's one of the things, one of the Big things that I can speak to is that in March, I had my first ever solo exhibition at Third Degree Glass Factory, and I specifically requested in March, it's the, I think it's the third Saturday in March, don't quote me, quote me on this, uh-huh. but my website, and I'll have the official dates ready, but I asked for that one because it's actually going to be the week before uh, Batman vs. Superman comes out, mm. and I specifically, the show that I pitched to them is I want to do a show where all my work is Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman themed. And so that will be happening in March. So what are your, okay, Do you everyone heard that, and all details will be on stephenwalden.com. Um, what are your thoughts as, you know, from one comic book nerd to another, what are your thoughts on this um this movie, man, which apparently this is the, going to be the launching <laughs> platform for their version of the, well, just the Justice League, you know, DC's version of, of the Avengers. Um, what are your thoughts on the trailers you've seen so far? What are your thoughts on all of it? Ben Affleck, what are your thoughts on all of it? So one of my problems with uh, Man of Steel, let's go back to that, is oh, it's okay. the first movie that I ever saw, Superman, any incarnation of Superman I have ever seen where I thought, I don't think I would want to be Superman in that, you know, when you watch Chris Reeve or you watch George Reeves or even any of the animated Superman, it's like, man, that would just be badass just to be Superman and just to be right, able right. to help people. But this one was, it was so dark and such a, a burden of being able to save people and to help people. And it's like, that's not what Superman is. You know, Batman is angst. Superman is hope and inspiration. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. And so when the first trailer came out, there was also, and I mean the very first, like maybe even the teaser, when we see, uh, you know, uh, where is it, Batman is in his, you know, Frank Miller armor and he has King, yeah. you know, Reed or whatever it is. You know, that one, I'm like, oh, it just, you know, it looks so morose. Then the second trailer came out and it was the first time we got a glimpse of Wonder Woman and I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board. I take it back. And then this one came out and I'm like, it's kind of a mixture of both. I was when I saw him. Whenever he, all right, that, I, I'm assuming we're talking about the last one that they did, where where, Bat, where Batman's hanging with a trench coat on. Somehow I'm just like, all right. First of all, I don't know oh, how yeah. he had the trench coat on, and then yeah, when Superman lands right there, he's got this scowl. He's like, he looks like it. Rem, literally, it reminded me of Superman three. Yeah. When he got hit with the red kryptonite, I'm like, whoa! Did we get some red kryptonite at some point? Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's interesting in that tonally, you know, what are they going to go for? How are they going to do it? I I just got a feeling that it's going to be it's too much. Uh, they're they're uh, the junk drawer, kitchen sink, DC and Warner are scrambling to make up for what Marvel has done, but Marvel's been doing it over the past seven years, and they're trying to hurry up and play catch up. And, yeah, I don't think okay. it's. I mean, I don't think it's almost like a. It's almost like a Ring of Honor trying to be WWE. It really won't ever happen, which is kind of crazy, man. Because I, how they have messed up such icon. The the the, the Batman's I've been cool with. How they've messed up the Superman, you know. I I don't know. I mean, they just have dropped the ball each time they touch that franchise, and it's just like, 
I don't know. And now this is supposed to be the launch of their their you know Justice League, and you know you're bringing uh-huh. in obviously Aquaman, Cyborg. You know, I don't know how all that's going to play out, but I don't know. They just seem to just drop the ball every time they touch any of these comic book movies. DC does. Do you watch any the the? Do you watch Arrow or Flash? You know, I've seen. I don't watch much TV, oddly enough, but I have seen some of it. And I literally ran into somebody last week um, at the live juke joint, ladies and gentlemen. Come on by the live juke joint. And he said to me, he said, he, he said the same. He's like, do you watch Arrow? He's like, Arrow's the best show on TV. He, he said it with such earnest. And this was a grown man, probably 47 years old. He's like, Arrow's the best show on TV right now. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've heard it's good. I, I've, I caught the season finale of Flash last year. I've always, my favorite hero in DC was always Firestorm. So, and I've heard they've introduced mm-hmm. Firestorm. So, I'm with it. I need yeah. to jump on it a little bit more because, I mean, it sounds like it's cool. I just, when I see that, I always just, that CW-type production just reminds me of just like Smallville. Not that Smallville was bad. It just, I don't know. It just, I just hate to see I, I them do TV Smallville. superheroes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? No, I get that. Yeah, Smallville, especially like from season four on, was just so formulaic. And, but and then I heard about... Gotham was great. I hear Gotham was amazing, but I did. I still I have not seen a single episode of that. I, seen the I still haven't that. dived into that because my thing with DC is I'm so tired of being such cockies. Is it's like, would you please give me, you know, our big superheroes in their outfits, in their uniforms? Yeah, that's and what that's we want, too. Exactly. I love when, that. When I, heard, when I heard Smallville, people were saying, you will never see an S on his chest. I'm like, well, I'm just not watching then. You know what I mean? I'm sure the story was great, but... You lost me there. Um, all right, me and this gentleman, me and Mr. Steven could probably nerd out on the uh, yeah. comic book movies and, and what's coming up all night. But we do have to wrap up. But before we do, um, so you pretty much gave your shout-out on uh, what you got or you know gave a brief on what you got coming up now. Um, any social media you got going on, um, it's www.stevenwalden.com. Do you have a Twitter and Facebook, or where can we all reach yeah. Twitter is at Stephen Walden, Instagram, Stephen Walden, and then Facebook is Stephen Walden Art. Or you can just have me as a friend. I'm not that judicious in who I'm screening on my friends as long as you're not an asshole and you don't, you know, if you're not putting out any racist or hateful stuff and, you know, we're cool with it, there's what the, that's what the unfollow button is for. Um, one of the things I did want to say that in terms of like what's coming up for me, one of my big goals uh, for 2016 is that in 2015, in half a year's time of partnering up with charities, I was able to help raise $20,000 for different charities. And so one of my goals for 2016 is to double that. And so that's, that's one of the big things that I'm hoping to do. And so we'll see. We're, we're going to get it kicked off really soon. Like the second week of January, which is like the week of my birthday, is, is going to be the, the Rankin Jordan Gala. What's your birthday? It's January 15th. Shut so, up. Yeah. That's so funny. That's my best friend's birthday, January 15th. Martin Luther the King's birthday, too, January 15th. Damn right it is. Yes, absolutely. That's what's up. Well, you heard it, folks, and it, you know, honestly, down the line, my friend, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. I'm hoping I'm hoping to grow this thing just like you're trying to grow your thing. As you try to, as you get stuff going on, feel free to come on when you uh, have events coming up and uh, want to plug them. Feel free to come on. I'll be more than happy to chat with you about what you have going on in the future, my friend. Sounds awesome, dude. This has been great. Well, you know I can't let you leave quite yet. Oh, there okay. was one thing you must endure, and that is the conspiracy triangle of doom, my friend. Very simple or complicated, however you want to make it. It is very simple. Three questions that you must answer. You can say yes or no, or you can elaborate if you will. Are you prepared? Okay. No, but good. Uh, give it to me. What you got? Yeah, let's do this. Do you, Mr. Stephen Weldon, Walden, I apologies, believe in the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence? Short answer, yes. Uh, I don't think that it exists in the way that we think that uh, we've been sold in 50s movies and close sure. encounters of the third kind. But there's, you know, probably some life form on Europa, um, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson, as I think he said a number of times, he wants to get a, a, a some kind of a, a probe that lands on Europa, goes underneath the frozen surface. Europa, that is, I'm sorry, what was on the mic there? Yeah, Europa, the moon that, of Jupiter. Europa is a, a, yeah, it's the moon of Jupiter, I believe. One that, of the moons of Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, one of the moons of Jupiter, and that uh, it's one of the ones that we're almost for certain has water, and we know that wherever there's water, there's going to be life. Or, we definitely yeah. just found out uh, something about Mars, right? We just officially... Found out water's I, on Mars as well? 
I, I think so. Maybe that there, there was some type of evidence at one point on Mars. I'm not entirely sure. But I think that to answer your question, yeah, I think that exists somewhere. Uh, will we find it in our lifetime? I don't know. It'd be really cool, though, if we did. Well, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that would be definitely uh, some interesting news. Uh, <laughs> question number two, ladies and gentlemen, do you, or, and as well as you, sir, do you believe uh, or do you follow the official version? Or do you believe the official story of the events of November 22nd, 1963? If you're not familiar, that is the assassination well, of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, John, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, with the old Italian rifle from the old Texas School Book yeah. Repository with the three shots. Yeah, the man liquor Carcano. I, uh, I would... He knows his stuff. <laughs> I was a JFK assassination buff in high school when the movie came out. And when it happened, uh, when when that came out, and I was researching Jim Mars Crossfire and Mars. Uh, JFK by L. Fletcher Prouty and all these other books, and I just I read, 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 and I was convinced that there was a conspiracy theory, especially with the magic bullet. But as I've gotten older, uh, and realizing that Fletcher Prouty did not convince you, no, no, no. Um, well, at the time it did. But wow. one, of the things, oh, I'm sorry. I one of the things, what, what convinced me the other way, you know, for the longest time, it was the magic bullet, the magic bullet, you know, which we all know that theory and how it was parodied in, you know, the, uh, in the Seinfeld episode, the magic movie. Um, I think there was, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there was a dateline um, uh, expose or something. Maybe it was Peter Jennings, and basically it, it the showed that. How, yeah, but it showed that. It, it didn't follow the path that we thought it did because we thought that it had to follow a certain path based on, you know, the different wounds. Regardless of the path from a ballistic standpoint, how does a bullet create seven wounds and come out absolutely pristine? It's never you know, happened I, in the history of ballistics. So I... Gerald I, Posner I, in his book, Case Closed, and I won't even talk about what I think about Gerald Posner. He said it did that because it slowed it slowed down enough to still puncture bone and go through skin, but it didn't. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's fine. I. What I will say that I think that, and I cannot remember the name of the. There's a someone who put forth the the explanation behind why we have all of these conspiracy theories behind Oswald is that it is. In many ways, it's easier to think that there is a massive grand and wheeling conspiracy that could kill someone so important as JFK <laughs> compared to, you know, a an abusive asshole, you know, of a waif. And the other mm -hmm. thing is that, you know, we know that Oswald attempted to kill a general months before. Um, and I, I will also say that. A, fa a fantastic book um, is out there, Stephen King's 11-22-63. I highly, highly recommend it. It's just a great story. Um, and the audio book is fantastic. You would appreciate it, Jeffrey. Um, the the, um, the performance is just killer. Um, no pun intended. Um, but it, 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 it lays this out in such a way that it's like, wow, it, I understood why at the time I needed to believe that there was a conspiracy because there's so much – so much more soothing to think that there is a grand and wheeling conspiracy compared to, you know, there's somebody that's so insignificant that could have such significance in the world in such a bad way rather than realizing that, you know what, sometimes bad shit happens without, you know, grand machinations behind it. It and absolutely that's does. Absolutely. No, I, that's true. It happens. They, they do happen. They do happen. Um, that's interesting. I find that interesting. You've, I, that you've listened to Fletcher Prouty. And yeah. So I mean, like, uh, Secret Service can just be pulled off like that. Uh, windows can be allowed to be open, like throughout the parade route. Um, like you can the changing you can, of the parade route. You can well, and that's the thing is, it's like do, that's, do, I'm sorry, that, that, there sorry. are conflicting reports in that you know was the parade route really changed or was the one that was given originally was actually wrong. After the and Bay so, of Pigs, after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy, as you know, fired Alan Dulles. Uh -huh. um, and Charles Cabell, and uh -huh. I, I think there was uh, Richard Bissell. The yeah. mayor the mayor of Dallas at the time of all of that was Earl Cabell, Charles Cabell's brother. Uh -huh. Now, these, I mean, I'm just saying, this is just one of these, all circumstantial, of course. It's just that one, was, 
those, those were the things that convinced me when I thought, because it, to pick a theory, when I was younger and when I first got into it, it was that our government was involved and that the CIA had something to I do with I don't like to say <laughs> our government. I don't like to use those. I mean, because it just sounds like so a wrong. shadow. Well, no, I like, wouldn't even say, like, I'm not even saying like Illuminati type shit. I think there was so much crazy stuff going back then with the, like, you know, uh, all that st- operations that Oswald was involved with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, David Ferry. Uh, Guy Bannister, all of that stuff in Lake Pontchartrain, training those exiles to go into Cuba. There was so uh-huh. much shady, all, and he was involved with that, with the Clay Shaw. I mean, there, you got to like kind of have nerded out on this stuff to really kind of, in my opinion, see how it all kind of ties together. But, um, I, you know, okay, that's you have get, we have we've had the most elaborate discussion on this conspiracy. <laughs> so, so the answer is, you thought you think Oswald was was the guy. Yeah, I think he was the guy. I haven't always thought that, so I appreciate both sides of the argument, though. And I took because I have, I have vehemently ascribed to both sides at one point or another in my life. Well, and, and I, now and honestly, most people give knee-jerk reactions. And honestly, sir, you you brought up names, and I've read all of their books of you know, Fletcher. I even watch videos. People go on go on YouTube, check out Fletcher Prouty's words on these subjects. Fletcher mm-hmm. Prouty, Jim Mars. Um, you know, you've dropped names, so obviously you're not just saying this from an unresearched standpoint and I, I honestly respect that opinion um i don't you know it's not, like, it's not that i disrespect you regardless i'm just saying you know everyone right. has their own opinion but yours is obviously informed and so whatever you yeah. decide you know it's you know not that i know what the hell i'm talking about it's just you know my my consideration my considerations suggest otherwise but you know and def- i remember when i wasn't ready to accept that low nut theory i just thought man that is just people just buying the bullshit how could they heard that too i've heard that people can't ex- I, you know somebody so big can be taken by, down by a person and that to me was always one of those knee-jerk uh just man if you just if you just heard maybe some backstory you wouldn't think this person was just some low nut he was very deeply entrenched with our government and our intelligence apparatus I think that whenever we have something that is so tragic and horrible and incomprehensible, we always want to look for a bigger explanation. That's the case with 9-11. That's the case with, I mean, a year ago, you know, or not a year ago, was it or two years ago, Sandy Hook, you know, oh, we're yes, on the oh, anniversary yes. of that. You know, there are people that believe that, you know, there's a conspiracy there. There are people yeah, that believe there's a conspiracy. Does yeah. Ronda Rousey. But I think that, you know, the... Did you say uh, Ronda Rousey? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think she's a truther. Um, no, she was a, she was uh, someone oh, that was. She did, a, a, she she did she, say something uh, about that know, back in the day. Yeah, I do uh, remember that. Uh, but so what I think is more interesting is our reactions to it, is that we're trying to figure it out. And I don't fault anyone for trying to figure it out. I don't at all. Right. I just, what I always hate is, is like, you've done your research, and I like I said, I will obviously respect your opinion these shortcuts to thinking with this whole, oh, you just want to, you know, he was just an important person and you just can't believe that, you know, it's uh-huh. just like, if you if you come to that conclusion after really seeing everything, I, I we can shake and uh, agree to disagree. But when you say that without really knowing shit, it just, you know, right. whatever, you can still come to the same conclusion, but it just, uh-huh. whatever. Anyway, <laughs> question yeah. number two, and you've kind of answered it already. Do you follow the narrative or do you believe the official story of the events of 9-11? Uh, jet fuel can't melt steel beams. Is that the thing? Um, uh, hey, I'm, there are two sides to this coin, and I just am saying, where do you... Yeah, I, I think, again, that... Because uh, in each, because in each, with all due respect, I mean, not even all due respect, in the JFK and the 9-11, there's so much invested, so much information on both sides. I could literally bring on an expert to talk both sides of this situation. Yeah. So it really kind of comes down to discernment. You know what I mean? To how What's... Thermate? Is Thermate a valid discussion? You know what I mean? It's just all that crap, you know? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I don't... At one point, I thought maybe that there could have been... Um, you know, and there's some kind of an inside job or that, you know, that there was some greater conspiracy. But, again, as I've gotten older, I realized that conspiracy theories often take a lot more work to get together than, you know, Occam's razor, which is, you know, the, what is it, the simplest Closest truth. Distance the distance between objects is a straight line. Yeah, and, and to me that's that's typically where I fall down or where, where I fall on is that side of it. Are there things that we don't know about that are going to come out in years and years and years from now that could change it? But 
for me right now, from what the way that I understand it, I don't I don't feel any need to you know I, I don't think that there's any grand and you know man I said grand and wheeling a lot in this conversation. <laughs> um, I don't think that there's any massive conspiracy that. Um, like goes to the highest levels of government or Illuminati or anything like that. Am I close off to it? I'm not close off to it, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's all that I'll say. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel you. Uh, they, they're all very, very interesting subjects, and there is information to be found on both sides. And, you know, it's one of those things, unless t I'm not even Tom Brokaw, whoever the anchors are, unless they say it, <laughs> That's not the official version. So we're, we may never really find the answers on any of these questions, UFOs, JFK, you know, any of this stuff. But I thank you so, so, so very much, sir, for coming on, man. This has been such a, such a very interesting conversation. Um, it's been awesome getting to know you. Um, we're obviously going to have to hang out a little bit more, you know. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. yeah, seriously, man. It's been cool talking to you about this stuff. www.stevenwalden.com, stevenwaldenart.com. You can also find him on Twitter on there. Check him out, man. He is doing cool stuff. Uh, continue success, my friend. And again, man, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. It's been awesome. Yeah, I'll probably be seeing you at the uh, the WrestleMania party this year. That's right. Painting again. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you, my friend. Good for you. It's all going good for this gentleman. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Stephen Walden. Stay tuned. We have more to come. Thank you for listening to It's Me Speaking to You. Please spread the word and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And stay tuned for more conversations with a variety of guests on a variety of subjects.